أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هل أتاك حديث الغاشية وجوه يومئذ خاشعة عاملة ناصبة تصلى نارا حامية تسقى من عين آنية ليس لهم طعام إلا من ضريع لا يسمن ولا يغني من جوع وجوه يومئذ ناعمة لسعيها راضية في جنة عالية لا تسمع فيها لاغية فيها عين جارية فيها سرر مرفوعة وأكواب موضوعة ونمارق مصفوفة وزرابي مبثوثة أفلا ينظرون إلى الإبل كيف خلقت وإلى السماء كيف رفعت وإلى الجبال كيف نصبت وإلى الأرض كيف سطحت فذكر إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر إلا من تولى وكفر فيعذبه الله العذاب الأكبر إن إلينا إيابهم ثم إن علينا حسابهم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ثم ما بعد The previous surah mentioned two kinds of people that Allah Azza wa Jal depicted and these were the people that were headed for the hellfire and then the people that were headed for paradise but the surah ended by highlighting the people that are headed in the wrong direction by the comments when Allah said بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا Rather all of you give preference, you give more weight to worldly life. So obviously Allah is criticizing and pointing out the reality of people who give preference to worldly life, meaning they're headed for failure in the end. Now these are the people that are being addressed in the very beginning of the next surah. Now in order to understand the placement of the ayah that we begin with today in Surah Al-Ghashiyah, Surah number 88, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ الْغَاشِيَةِ the address is to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know this by because of the, the pronoun, the attached pronoun, ka. Hal ataka hadith al The ka referring to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the benefit of knowing this is as follows. You see in the previous surah, the, towards the last part of the previous surah, there was an address to the, to the kuffar directly in the second person. You give preference to worldly life. The, the you is second person. But now there's another second person. Now Allah is talking to His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, saying, "Did the news of the overwhelming covering event, Ghashiyah, that which covers, did the news of that come to you? Meaning, come to you, O Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? It, it is as though Allah has turned away from the kuffar and now is talking to His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And that's the tra- transition we're trying to understand. The benefits of these kinds of transitions are many, and we'll talk about them as the, uh, we continue our study of the ayah. But let's just first note some things about this format of speech. Hal ataka. We find this elsewhere in the Quran. In Surah Taha, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Hal ataka hadithu Musa. In Nazi'at and Taha, actually. Then in Surah Sad, Allah says, Hal ataka tabawa ul khasmu is tasawar ul mihrab. In Surah Al Dhariyat, we find Hal ataka daifu Ibrahim. Daifu Ibrahim. Al Mukramin. We find in Surah Al Buruj, we read already, Hal ataka hadithu al junud. Fir'auna wa Thamud. So this format is used elsewhere in the Qur'an also. Now the word atta, let's take it piece by piece, the word atta means to come or to arrive. There's another word in Arabic for coming and arriving, which is ja'a. And we read this in other places too. For example, we read, فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الصَّاخَ فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الطَّامَّةُ الْكُبْرَى So the first question is, why not use ja'a here? Why use atta here? What's the difference between them? Why, why does Allah not say, subhanahu wa ta'ala, هَلْ جَاءَكَ Hadith al What's the diff? Why did he say Hal ataka Hadith al The word Jaa is used for something enormous, something heavy. 
So something that has a lot of magnitude in it and is more powerful than the word ja' or the one that it implies in its struggle, effort, weight, burden, these kinds of things, ja' is used. Something that is easier by comparison, ata is used. When a tamma, the, the drowning calamity is spoken about, asakha, right? Those are spoken about, ja'a is used. But when the speech about them, Allah here does not say, hal ja'at kal ghashiya. No, it's not ghashiya itself, it's hadith al ghashiya. The speech of the ghashiya. Ghashiya referring to the overwhelming and overshadowing calamity, being the, the day of judgment. But Allah is not talking about, did the day of judgment come to you? The news of the day of judgment. Did the news itself come to you? The news itself comes easily. The news itself is easy. The event itself is difficult. So when the event comes, Allah uses ja'a. Ja'at al sakha Ja'at al tammat al kubra But when simply the news of it is mentioned, by comparison, that's much lighter. So ata is used. And that's the, the, the eloquence of the word ata here in this text. The other thing is it's in a question format. Allah says, did the news of this not come to you? Or this, did the news of this come to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa What's the point of asking this kind of a question? It's very simple. I mean, the, the ulama of, of uh, rhetoric, of balagha, of eloquence, explain it in technical terms, but the juice of it is as follows. You know, if you were my student and you failed a test, right? And you're the, I'm the principal of the school, let's imagine. You failed the test. And then I come to the teacher who did his job. He did everything he was supposed to do. And I say to him, didn't you already teach them everything you were supposed to? You know, and I'm not really criticizing the teacher. Who am I now criticizing? The students, and I'm doing this in two ways. I've turned away from the students. I'm not even talking to them. It's a show of my anger. The other is, I'm talking to the teacher, almost reinforcing that, yes, he in fact did his job. It's not like he, anything was missing on his behalf. Allah is so angry at those who give preference to worldly life, dunya, that fail him after this incredible message came to him, to them. And so much so, even after, after the, the evidences of the previous surah, and the calls to reflect in Surah Al-A'la, there was another reason mentioned at the end. إِنَّ هَذَا لَفِ الصُّحُفِ الْأُولَى صُحُفِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى This is something that was in the scrolls given to Ibrahim alayhi salam and to Musa alayhi salam. And we said, this is particularly relevant mentioning both of these, because these were the two groups, the Mushrikun of Quraysh, and the people of the book, the Mushrikun of Quraysh, tie their legacy to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the people of the book begin their legacy with Musa alayhi salam. So it's not just that there's enough for you to reflect on in your own life. If you reflect on your legacy, then this is the same conclusion you should be coming to. And they don't. So now in threatening words, isn't it enough that the news of the, the covering event has come to you? Isn't that enough? So there's this address to the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam in anger by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in retaliation in response to their lack of mo- movement, their lack of reaction. They feel nothing, even though this incredible news has come to them. So the, the surah begins with a depiction of punishment and torture, the horrors of the Day of Judgment. It quickly moves into the hellfire. Why the hellfire first? Because these were the people deserving hellfire that were mentioned at the end of the previous surah first. So it's connected to that discussion. The word hadith. It came up before when we, when we talked about هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى إِذْ نَادَاهُ رَبُّهُ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى Let's re- review some things about the meanings of the word hadith. It literally means something that becomes manifest, like an event. Al-hadithah, or huduth, to occur, something that occurs, something that happens. It is also used in the meaning of something new. And in that sense, it, it's used even for an old event or for a known event. Like the, the mention of the Day of Judgment is over and over and over again in the Qur'an, so it's not something new. But when it is being brought to your attention as though you had heard it but never really thought about it, and it feels like this is the first time you're really internalizing it, then it's a new thing to you at that time. So the word hadith is being used here as though it is a new event. Now take, take a new look at it. Take a new look at it. So it's not just naba even, it is hadith. Hal ataka hadith. So now let's turn to the word ghashiya. Ghashiya comes from the verb ghashiya, yagsha, and the, and the mastar, the infinitive form, ghishawatun. This word is a, it's used many, many, many places in the Quran. In Surah Yusuf, it's the only place that this exact ism fa'il form is used. Uh, where Allah Azza wa Jalla says, أَفَأَمِنُوا أَن تَأْتِيَهُمْ غَاشِيَةٌ مِنْ عَذَابِ رَبِّهِمْ That's the only place. Otherwise, other forms of the word ghashiyah are used, past, present, mustar, etc. Now this word, which literally means to cover something up entirely, is now being described, is being used in this ayah to describe the event of the next life. Qiyamah. It is an adjective of al-qiyamah. Al-qiyamah al-ghashiyah. Now, 
this word itself tells us that Allah wants us to know about this day some things. One of which is it will overwhelm, it will cover the entire earth. This day and its, its event will cover. We've learned already in previous surahs that this event will start, or one of its worst you know, depictions will happen in the sky. The sky tearing up, turning into doors, right, and it being peeled. And of course the sky is that which covers us. So when the sky starts showing these signs, we are covered and enveloped in the signs of the ghashiyah. The other thing is, it's a, it's a beautiful connection to what already came in the previous surah. When we said, we talked repeatedly about بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا You give preference to worldly life. Human beings are tied up in business or family or whatever other things, entertainment, things that are keeping them away from realizing their real purpose in life. This one thing will overshadow and cover over everything that people have been running towards. It will over, it, almost like casting a shadow on their hearts. It will cast a shadow on all their goals, all their aspirations. A moment ago, before this event begins, somebody's worried about their business. Somebody's checking their balance and the, you know, they're checking their online bank statements. Some mother is feeding her child, you know, some food. Some people are just having chit chat conversations. Some people are making plans about moving, etc., etc. All of these things are happening, and a, and a split second later, all of that is overshadowed. All of that is covered with this event that undoes all those other things. All of those other plans and speeches and discussion and concern, all of them become irrelevant all of a sudden. So, Hal Ataka Hadithul Ghashiyah. Now, just a few other things about this, this istifham, this question form that Allah Azza wa Jal uses in the ayah. Al istifhamu fi hadhihi al ayat wa ukhra, meaning in these kinds of ayat and others like them, fa'iduhu tasdiqu al amr wal haq min taqreen al khabr. As the Mufassirun comment, the benefit of this is that this confirms the matter. Didn't it come to you? Meaning it's for sure come to you. Didn't, didn't I, the same way you talk to your child, you say, didn't I tell you to go there? Which means I for sure told you to go there, right? So that format, I have for, for certain Allah is saying, given you full depiction of the news of that event, but I'll present them to you in a new fashion altogether again. لِلتَّشْوِيق إِلَى اسْتِمَاعِ الْخَبْرِ This is done to call the attention of the listener. And this is done even now. Did I tell you to do this? Now when you say it like that, it's a threatening tone. And here, again, even though the address is to the Messenger wasallam, the real threat isn't to the Messenger. It is to those who are not listening to the Messenger. So Allah is doing two things at the same time. He's scolding the kuffar by these wordings. And at the same time, He's encouraging and acknowledging His support for His Messenger wasallam, at the same time. Then, the other thing in this, uh, as far as this ayah is concerned, there's a beautiful narration. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed by this woman. مَرَّ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَى مْرَأَةٍ تَقْرَأْ She was reciting هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ الْغَاشِيَةِ She was reciting this surah. فَقَامَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَسْتَمِعُ وَيَقُولُ He stood there, he stopped walking, he stopped. He just started listening to her. And then he said, نَعَمْ قَدْ جَاءَنِي Yes, it has come to me. But the wording of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not atani, it is ja'ani. It came to me, meaning this news was even heavy on him. Because ja'a is heavy and ata is light. So Allah used the light word, but the messengers, because it impacted him in such a heavy way sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says ja'ani, it has come to me. Then we go to the next ayah, Allah azza wa uses the word wujuh. It's very powerful. Faces, faces. Usually what we call this in Arabic grammar is the mubtada. It's the beginning of a sentence. And it's supposed to be ma'rifah. Okay? Uh, Mu'arraf billam. It's supposed to be al-wujuhu yawma'idhin khashi'ah. That's the norm. Normally we expect an alif lam in the beginning of a sentence that is noun based. But here we don't see an alif lam. What that does for us is a few things. First of all, when we read the word wujuh, we can no longer translate it as faces. We have to translate it as some faces. The word some will occur because there's no alif lam there. Some faces. Others say also لِلتَّعْظِيمَ أو لِلتَّكْثِيرِ This tadween, what it does is it lets us know there will be many faces in this way. What, whoever, the faces being descri- described are many, many in number. That comes from the tadween. And also there are some. So how is some and many together? It seems like they're contradictory ideas. The idea of many multitudes is there. But when I say some, then what I'm implying is there's another group. In other words, when wujuh is used, yes, there will be many of them. But already we know Though Allah is describing a certain group of people and their faces, there necessarily will be coming another description of another group. Because when you say some people did this, 
then you're expecting other people did that. There's another expectation. And that expectation is generated linguistically by not mentioning alif lam here. And so we find later on, wujuhun again. There'll be another wujuhun yawma idin na'ima li sa'iha radiyah. That's coming up too, right? Now let's look at the description of these faces. First of all, Allah says, wujuhun yawma idin. This dharf zaman, this, this object of time. Faces on that day. Usually an object of time in Arabic sentence structure is expected at the end. So wujuhun khashi'atun yawma idhin. That is normally how the Arab would speak back in the day. But there's this taqdeem, it's been brought earlier. Yawma idhin is in the middle of the mubtada and the khabar. Right? So you have wujuhun, then what was expected at the end in the middle, and then khashi'a at the end. Now what this shuffle does is it creates this effect called al-ikhtisal. And the way we translate that simply in English is, especially on that day, or it is only on that day that some faces, who will be many in number, are going to experience, there's going to be a, a, an expression on them, and that expression is the word khashi'a. Khashi'a. Now in the previous surah, we didn't have the word khushu'a with a ayn at the end, we had the word khashi'a. Khashi'a with a ya at the end. Okay? For example, in the previous surah we read, we, we read سَيَذَّكَّرُ مَنْ يَخْشَى Yaksha, that was the word used there. What's the difference between khashya and khushu'a? Similar words, the, the kha and the sheen are there, but the last letter instead of ayn is a ya in the previous surah, right? Khashya is to be afraid of something bigger than yourself. But khushu'a is to be so afraid that your muscles become numb. You become weak in your bones, right? The fear starts paralyzing you. That is called khushu'a. That is something described of the state of a believer where? In the salah, that is khushu'a. It's not just fear felt in the heart, it starts affecting the rest of your body. It starts affecting your limbs. You can feel khushu'ah in your, in your bones, basically. That's the, that's the image of khushu'ah. Allah describes these spaces on that day a step above khashiyah. He doesn't say, wujuhun yawma idhin khashiyah biya. Right? He says, wujuhun yawma idhin khashiyah with ayn. With ayn. They, the faces on that day will be overwhelmed with fear, so much so that there will be a numbness on them. There will be this overwhelming exhaustion and numbness on those faces as a result of that fear. Now the thing that's really interesting is, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions khushur, this idea of overwhelming fear, causing limbs to become loose, or limbs to become numb. He uses this for many different limbs on the Day of Judgment. For example, he says, خَاشِعَةً أَبْصَارُهُمْ تَرْهَقُهُمْ ذِلَّةً right? Their eyes will experience khushur. Then he says, خَشِعَةِ الْأَصْوَاتِ لِلْرَحْمَانِ Voices. Meaning the tongues will become full of this khushu. They'll become, they'll start to stutter out of fear. Then Allah Azza wa Jal says, for example, uh, in, in this ayah here, the faces experience khushu. But for a believer, what experiences khushu? What does Allah describe? أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Right? The qalb, the hearts experience khushu. But for the kafir, it's, this is beautiful, for the disbeliever on the day of judgment, Allah describes his eyes experience khushu. Allah describes his face experiences khushu. Overwhelming fear that numbs it. But Allah does not describe his heart. Because whose heart experiences khushu? The believer. So whenever you find khushu associated with the heart, that is only mentioned in case of the believer. Allah does not grant that honor to the disbeliever. Because when you give khushu, that, that, that uh, verb of khushu, when you give it to any other limb, then it's actually humiliating. But when you give it to the heart, it shows humility to Allah. But when you say, my eyes became, my, my eyes have khushur, or were full of khushur, right? Or my face has khushur. Then the ulama of tafsir in, in explaining this ayah comment, this is ghayat al-dhul. This is the, the nth degree, or this is the extreme amount of humiliation heaped upon this person, that they've reached the state of fear, that they've been overwhelmed, subhanAllah. The other thing that's interesting is Allah does mention the fear of hearts for disbelievers in one place. Allah says, قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ wajifa. We've read this already, right? Wajif is used. And what's amazing is, the Arab used to say, أَوْ جَفْتُ الْخَيْلَ I caused the, the horse to become scared. When I slapped the horse really hard, it got scared. In other words, the word used for fear of the disbeliever is the one the Arab used to use for animals. Allah did not use khushu' for the kafir's heart, but he uses wajif, which is only used by the Arab for who? For animals. SubhanAllah, this is a tahqeer. This is a, an insult to the kafir that his heart does not fear except like the fear of an animal. Instead of fearing Allah, what, what is the heart fearing? It's fearing the calamities that are going around. 
there's much greater the fear than even the calamities on the day of judgment and that is the fear of Allah himself subhanahu wa ta'ala so now hal ataka hadithul ghashiyah wujuhun yawma idhin khashi'ah now uh, this is again in the previous surah we said sayadhakkaru man yakhsha the, the who will take benefit of reminder who will actually soon internalize reminder is the one who fears but now a state worse than fear has been described by using the word al khushu'a aamilatun nasiba the word amal is very common a lot of people know what amal means it means work aamila means these faces that have been put to work how does a face get put to work you ever see someone who comes home from a long day of work what they look like you could tell from their face that they're exhausted that they've been working the face of a worker and the face of someone on vacation are two different faces it's like when you, when you come back from vacation to your job people say i don't recognize you you look like a different person because your face your wajh is no longer amil your face is not overwhelmed by the the it doesn't have the look of exhaustion and work on it allah uses this this word to describe a few things number one on the day of judgment it illustrates that there's some work going on on the day of judgment when these events this ghashiya starts over covering then you're running around trying to escape right kalla la wazar ila rabbika yawma idhin almustaqar there's people trying to find a place to hide something that they can they can find some kind of refuge in and they're exhausting themselves doing so then we know on the day of judgment we have to stand for a re- really long time in a labor some kind of way and answer a lot of questions this is this is an exhausting activity so amila is used but others like for example ibn abbas radiyallahu anhu comments in his tafsir of the word amila here that this was in the case of dunya so he says وَذَلِكَ لِأَنَّهُمْ لَمْ يَخْشُوا اللَّهَ فِي الدُّنْيَا فَلَمْ يَعْمَلُوا لَهُ فَلَمْ يَنْصِبُوا فِي طَاعَتِهِ أَجْسَادَهُمْ فَأَضْطَرَّهُمْ فِي ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمِ إِلَىٰ أَعْظَمَ مِمَّا أَبَوْهُ أبوه فِي الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْمُضِرَّةِ دُونَ الْمُنْفِعَةِ سبحان الله ابن عباس رضي الله عنه says this state of them being exhausted is because they did not work in dunya in this dunya they did not do the works the actions that Allah had demanded of them and they exhausted themselves in things other than dunya other than islam for dunya itself so you will have you know we're not the only ones who work hard to provide for a family right one time this christian monk came to to umar radiyallahu anhu and he was very old you could tell he has given his life in worship in christian worship and umar radiyallahu anhu saw him and he started crying and the sahaba asked him why are you crying this you know what made you cry and he looked at he looked at the christian monk and he said aamilatun nasiba You know this this monk has exhausted his labor worked night you know hours and hours and hours of a day years and years of his life given up his youth for a kind of worship that Allah will not accept how sad is that state so he felt sorry enough to cry for that person subhanallah right so this is the idea of amila false worship people are engaged in false worship another kind of amal that people engage ourselves this is the kind of worship we do nowadays where the messenger cursed taisa abdul dinar dinar wa abdul dirham right may the slave of the literally dollar dollar and cent right dinar and dirham may they be destroyed we give our entire lives to work we give them up to work you you go to work you're con- you're, you're concentrated on you know expanding your career and making it higher and higher up the corporate ladder you're on vacation you're talking to people about work even when you you bring work at home you take work to work and you bring it at home your whole life becomes work you're working 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 and the only you know you talk to an engineer all they want to talk about is engineering stuff even when they're not at the office you talk to an accountant man taxes this year right that's what they want to talk about you talk to somebody in medicine that's all they want to talk about is medicine right their, their careers become so much so in some psychologists say <clears throat> you know you are what you do right so they become just that you ask them who are you or what are you they'll say i'm an accountant or i'm a teacher or i'm a physician no i'm a human being i'm a muslim right there are other things you are this is just a small part of what you are right but you just identify yourselves as that and that becomes you and so all you have to show for yourself is advancement in this career you built this empire in a business or you've built your name your reputation with this tenure in this company right or you've waited all the way to like you know this top level executive position and you're tired after all those years people lose their you know destroy their marriages before family right for 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 their careers people <coughs> lose uh, touch with their children their children rebel and leave the home the only reason they come to their parents is because their parents are a good cash register for them right all for what what are their lives gone in they're gone in work 
And now they come before Allah on the day of judgment. You know, you figure when you, when you die, now it's time to rest. That's why in English even they say, rest in peace. But these people are raised exhausted. They are raised, amila. Their faces are still exhausted. And what is ahead of them? Can you imagine? These, these disbelieving people who gave preference to worldly life didn't even enjoy dunya. They were working 70 hours a week, 50 hours a week, commuting half of their lives. In a, they spent their half their lives stuck in traffic in a car, right? Just exhausting themselves. And now they're tired. Now they're standing in front of Allah. Guess what? That was, that was vacation compared to what is coming. Now they have to stand in front of Allah. Now they have to head into the hellfire. But are they prepared physically to be ready for that? They're already exhausted. Amila. And above amila, nasiba. The next adjective. The word nasib means to be pegged inside the ground. Nasib literally means to be pegged. Also, it's, a, it's from Asma al Abdad, it means to be prominent. Another thing it means, it, because it's from the uh, Asma al Abdad, it means to be wobbly. Meaning so tired you can't even stand straight. You're completely overrun by work. You just want to crash. You just want to crash, right? Now, the idea, you know what they do in uh, especially like uh, expensive hotels? or luxury homes, or that, those kinds of places, they look very comfortable, very inviting beds, lots of cushions on the beds, big couches, nice lounge. The idea of making you feel relaxed, because they're designed mostly for executives, right? Who do these long trips, or they have a long flight, or they have these long, long meetings, they're tired. So they, the, the marketing is, you want to give them a sense of relaxation. There's water flowing, there's waterfall inside the lobby of the hotel. This is modern stuff, right? Nice couches, cushions. These are just things to relax with. There's a bar right around the corner. That's what they usually do with glasses hanging there. Right? This is the scene that's being depicted. Now, on the Day of Judgment, this guy is finally done with work. He wants to come and relax. Amilatun nasiba. They're completely overrun by work. But let's see what Allah Azza wa has installed for them. Tasla naran hamia. They will be throwing themselves. Tasla is not in the passive, in the mabni ala al-majhul form. This is in the <coughs> Ma'roof form Binayat al fa'il This is the construction where the subject is known They themselves are throwing themselves in Let's see what Al- uh, Alusi Rahimahullah in Ruh al-Ma'ani has to say فَأُحِيطَ بِهَا مِن كُلِّ جَانِبٍ وَهُوَ يَدُلُّ عَلَى غَايَةِ الدُّلْ لِأَنَّ مَنْ فَعَلَ بِنَفْسِهِ هَذَا لَا يَكُونَ إِلَّا كَذَلِكَ Allah sa- He says rather that they will be completely overrun by fire They will be surrounded in all, by all sides in fire and this illustrates the worst kind of humiliation because what, what other result other than humiliation can there be if they themselves are doing the act? Because tasla doesn't mean they will be thrown, it means they will throw themselves. They will go in themselves. Now the word tasla has a ta in the beginning which refers to the ta at ta'nith, the ta for feminine and the feminine is being used because wuju faces is a broken plural, jama' taksir and the, the, that's what it's used for. In other words, faces will cast themselves in. Now think about that. If there's a fire or anything be hurled towards your body, what's the natural instinct of the human being? What do they protect first? You protect your face. You put your arm out, immediately it comes out. There's a natural instinct to guard your face. And Allah describes in this surah, what are they throwing into the fire willingly? Willingly first. What are they chucking in first? Their face. Tasla, the ta illustrates the face is going into the fire. Subhanallah. Tasla naran hamiya. Let's see. Now what, how this word hamiya, which is a new adjective for the fire, is understood. Hamaytu al-madida, ma yaburruhu. This is an expression of the Arab. I prevented the patient, patient from getting things or eating things that would have harmed him. Hama in Arabic, or himaya, literally in its most raw form, means to prevent something from you, to keep you from getting something. So naran hamiya, it's some kind of a preventative fire. Now what the word hamiya... And, Another thing that it means is a scorching flame of like the desert sun is also called hami. Okay? Hamat al shams, the Arab would say. That the sun became scorching, scorching hot. So now, one of the meanings of hamia here, of course, is that it's scorching fire. But the other is it's got some sort of a preventative feature. It prevents your skin from burning off. Because if it burnt off, the pain would be over. But it, it prevents it from burning off. It prevents you from getting any rest. It prevents you from getting any, any breaks, any stop in the pain, subhanAllah. All of this by Allah Azza wa Jal giving the adjective hamiya, naran hamiya. Allahumma la taj'alna min ashab al-nar. Tasla naran hamiya, tusqa min aynin aniya. These faces will be given to drink. 
now again, people are not being described, their faces are being described. We should understand the tone of the surah. Why the faces are being highlighted? Expressions, emotions, dignity, right? Arrogance, humility, all of these things are manifest where in a human being. You can't tell if I'm arrogant or not from my hands. Where do you tell it from? My face, the way I, the, the, the facial expressions, the body language, most of it which is captured on the face. Fear is captured on the face. Anger is, anger is captured on the face. <coughs> now those same faces that used to consume the haram, they used to consume the haram. Now as a result, what are they going to get in the, in the akhirah? Tusqa, those faces will be given to drink. And literally, siqaya in Arabic is to give somebody to drink in their mouth. Meaning literally they open their mouth and you pour it in it. Right? This is siqaya. Usually it's done for animals, but it can also be done for people. Right? So you just pour the water out and they're drinking like that. Right? Now, what this illustrates is, first of all, they went into this scorching fire. There's absolutely no relief. So now they're desperate. They got to find relief somewhere. So the relief from fire naturally comes from where? From water. So Allah Azza wa Jal describes ayn. They will be given to drink from a spring. From ayn is a spring. And ayn, interestingly in Arabic, is only used for beautiful and good things. Because the Arab, of course they're in the desert, so one of the most valuable things to them, a fantasy to them is to see a water spring, a waterfall, water gushing out. And this is the word Ain. Ain is also used for the eye. Because it, you know, it sheds a tear. So water comes out and it's, it looks like it's moist all the time. And that's why the word Ain is also used for the eye. Anything that looks really good to the eye, they would also call Ain. Sometimes in Arabic poetry, they'd call a beautiful horse Ain. The Quran calls Hurun Ain because they're beautiful to look at. Ain is used, right? So the word Ain usually has a very positive uh, meaning. But here, so they're going to be given to drink from Ain. So you figure, okay, now at least they get some relief. But Allah gives an adjective to that Ain, which is Aniya. You know, Ana Ya'ni in Arabic, from it comes with the Arabic expression Al-An. Many of you have heard the word Al-An before, now, right? An, an is a, the, the uh, ism fa'il version or the active participle version of the word Ana. And what it means actually is two things. It has two meanings in it. Of the time to have come. Al-an means now. Time to have come. Also means when you boil water or any liquid. And it's the time has come where it's reached the final boiling point. Where it's actually bubbling up. Right? And it's ex intense and it's bubbling. The final, final time of boiling. That's the time that it becomes ania. So the spring is gushing out water. But it only starts gushing when it's reaching the most intense part of the heat. And where is this water coming? Right onto their faces. Their faces are being made to consume. Tusqa min aynin aniya. Subhanallah. What punishment after punishment Allah describes. As if tasla, naran hamiya wasn't intense enough. Now on top of this, tusqa min aynin aniya. Now if you go to the first word in the surah, al-ghashiya. Hal ataka hadithu al-ghashiya. That which covers up. Two things have already covered the people up. These kuffar, they have once been covered up by the fire. Right? Their faces will be covered by fire. On the other hand now, they are covered in boiling water. They are covered in this intense heat of the fire, of, of the water. Now, the next ayah, inshallah ta'ala, before, actually before we go to the next ayah, one last thing in this ayah. This, the word ayn literally also means a spring that comes out. Okay? So this is actually a spring inside the hellfire whose only purpose is to gush out boiling water, bubbling boiling water. Another word for boiling water or really hot water is ghalyun, which is used, for example, in Surah Al-Dukhan. يَغْلِي فِي الْبُطُونَ غَلْيَ الْحَمِيمِ But the difference between ghali and, you know, uh, here, ayn and aniya, the difference between them is ghali means water that boils, rises up, it froths up. And Allah describes that horrendous punishment that that water is inside their stomach and it starts frothing up. So it adds to the torture even within their bodies when they drink that water. May Allah protect us again from the tortures of the hellfire. The word tusqa in the end I mentioned again. Some have uh, in a different qira'a of the ayah read, recited instead of tusqa, tasqa. And the difference that would make is that it would become active. Meaning they will themselves go to drink. If you read tusqa, the implication is they're being held and water is being poured on them. If you read Tasqa, it means they are so desperate from the fire that they themselves go into the water and they try to drink even though it's bubbling hot. Even they themselves go. That's what that little change of harakah means. Inshallah, how much time do we have left? Do we have a little bit of time? 33? 
Okay, we can probably do one more ayah, inshallah. Or two more ayahs. لَيْسَ لَهُمْ طَعَامٌ إِلَّا مِنْ ضَرِيعٍ Now we've spoken about drink. The next logical thing to talk about is food. They will have no, they have no food for them. The first thing I should note about this is that laysa usually occurs and normally occurs in the Arabic language for present tense, for immediate situations. Okay? It is not for the future, it is not for the past, it is for the immediate present. But this burning in the hellfire and torture, when is that going to happen? In the future. Why is Allah talking about that in the present? This itself illustrates the anger of Allah on these people. It is as though they are already there. They are being asked to imagine themselves already there. As though right now they have nothing to eat for themselves except bariya. Now the word lahum, which is jar wa majrur, it's supposed to be at the end. Again, it's brought in the beginning. This taqdeem, what it says is, it is, it is for those people especially that there will be no food at all. لَيْسَ لَهُمْ طَعَامٌ No food will be there at all for them. The format illustrates that there will be food for others. There will be food for others. It is not for them that there will be any food. Implying there will be food for others. The implication of others is there because the word lahum is in the beginning. Had it been laysa ta'amun lahum, then there would be no implication of others. So even by saying laysa lahum ta'amun, it is a threat and an illustration of anger against the kuffar. But at the same time, it is actually a mercy implied to the believers because you will have food. They will have something to eat. Laysa lahum ta'amun illa min dariya. Uh, except the only thing they will eat from is min bariya. Now the word min is really important too. From out of this thing Allah calls bariya. Bariya in Arabic literature is two things. One it's used for raw seaweed. Like the, the nasty seaweed that pulls up on the shore. Right, that animals don't even like to eat. And human beings for, cer for certain wouldn't want to eat unless it's somehow processed or whatever. <coughs> the other is the word bariya is used for a thorny kind of plant in the Arab uh, t you know, terrain called shibriq. And this plant has a lot of very sharp, long thorns. And animals usually try to graze, but they don't graze near it because when they try to eat it, it hits them in their face. It pokes them in their face and causes them to bleed. So it's poisonous and thorny and itchy, and it's the last thing the animal would want to do is eat from it. The only animal that can try and eat from it is the camel. And that will become important as we continue our study of the surah. The camel, they have you know, thicker lips, and they, have, they can consume and they can chew on even tough and rough things. And this is part of the amazing, you know, miracle of the, 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 the camel that it can survive in a place like the desert, you know, for a goat or for a cow. You have to provide them food. But the, even a poor man could own a camel because he doesn't have to provide food. It can go eat any shrubs or anything. It can survive. Anyhow, Allah says they will not have any kind of food except this bariya. There are three kinds of food that Allah mentions in the Quran in the hellfire. There's zakum, there's ghislin, is ghislin, and then there is this word, bariya. Most ulama comment that bariya is the general word for all the things underneath. So zakum is a kind of bariya, and ghislin is a kind of bariya. So bariya is the most comprehensive term. Now the word bariya, again, this thorny food, Allah did not, did not say, لَيْسَ لَهُمْ طَعَامٌ إِلَّا بَرِيعًا He said, إِلَّا مِنْ bariya. <coughs> the lahum illustrates that they'll actually be going looking for food for themselves. They'll have to go look around for food. And that their stomachs will force them to look around for food. Now when they're looking around for food, they see this horrible plant. And they have to actually go into that plant and eat it. And as they're trying to go in, what is happening already? They're, they're not being served that plant. They have to min bariya. They have to go from it and get it from there. So they're actually being tortured by, by even the contact of the plant. <coughs> not to mention the fact that they're eating it. The last thing I should comment about this ayah, the present tense form. If the kafir, Here's these ayat, this threatening tone. Because you know, the previous surah ended sort of on a soft note. It said, بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى The hereafter is better and longer lasting. It's soft advice. It's not saying you better listen. But it's saying, no, there's better for you in the hereafter. But now if soft advice doesn't work, just like in any form of education, you try to tell the kids in the classroom, calm down nicely, calm down nicely. What happens at the end? Who wants to go to the principal's office? Right? It turns to that state. Now, Allah starts softly. And think about your legacy. Suhufi Ibrahim wa Musa. Soft advice. But if that doesn't work, if you're still not willing to listen, then let's turn to what, you're really what might work for you. 
And even as harsh as these ayat are, if they penetrate into the heart of the disbeliever and it scares him to rethink his life, that is a mercy too. Even that is a mercy. The knowledge of the most horrible punishments in Quran, that they themselves are a mercy from Allah Azza wa Jal. So they, every time the kafir now decides to eat food, you know what's going to come to his mind? I actually have nothing to eat except dariya. Because it's mentioned in the present tense. And it's going to make him think twice. If he has an ounce of fear left in him, subhanAllah. But some kuffar didn't even have that. So what did they do? وَيُرْوَى أَنَّ كُفَّارَ قُرَيْشٍ قَالُوا لَمَّا سَمِعُوا صَدْرَ الْآيَةِ إِنَّ الضَّرِيعَ لَتُسْمِنُ عَلَيْهِ إِبَلَنَا فَنَزَلَتْ لَا يُسْمِنُ Some of them said, these kuffar, they said, Oh, dari'ah? We're going to get dari'ah? That's not so bad. Our camels can eat it. They can survive. So they started making fun of the idea that Allah Azza wa Jal <coughs> is going to give them dariya. Allah responded the next ayah, La tusminu. It will not give, and tusmin, what the word they use, that it, give, it makes our camels fat and tough, and they can survive in the desert, so we'll get tough too. Allah says, La tusminu. It doesn't add to your fat. In other words, it's not, it doesn't have any nutrition for your body. None whatsoever. It's not nutrition at all. Wala yughni min ju' and worse even, first of all, it's not nutritious. And that's not so bad for the kafir, because even nowadays we eat a lot of things that aren't nutritious. Right? People consume things that are not nutritious and say, what's the big deal? I can have not nutritious things. But Allah says one thing further. He says, Wala yughni min ju' and it will not make them free of need from hunger. It will not relieve them from feeling the need to feed themselves. In other words, they'll keep eating and keep eating and keep eating. And you know, already we learned that they went after the food out of desperation. And now when you finish eating, you know, before your order comes at the restaurant, you're sitting there, when's it coming, man, I've been here for 10 minutes, I'm going to tear this plate up. When you're done eating, you say, oh, I think I ate too much. You know, you don't, I can't even look at it anymore, just pack it up for me, right? That's the, the, that happens. But imagine these people, they're eating the worst kind of food. The wor- it's not even food. <coughs> the two things that food is supposed to do is first, it should, elite, you know, it should taste like something. It should add to your, it somehow it benefits your body. And then it relieves your hunger, the two essential functions of food. None of them are being provided by this dhari, and can they still stop? They'll still keep on going. When you, when you taste something disgusting, what do you do? What's your first natural reaction? Blech. You, get, you throw, spit it out of your mouth, or you say, no more thanks. It's great, but I just have a bad stomach right now. Or you make an excuse, you don't want to eat anymore. But these kuffar are being made to eat over and over and over again, adding further to their humiliation. May Allah save us from the humiliation of the hellfire. On that note, inshallah, because the, next, the rest of the surah now starts talking about the other faces, wujuhun yawma idhin na'ima, we'll give them their due, inshallah, after the break. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.